Good morning, everyone. Welcome and happy Father's Day to all you brothers, all you fellow fathers. Um, we're going to be looking this morning at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, if you want to turn there and get ready. But let me, um, let me uh, introduce the subject a little bit before we get there. Um, Father's Day and, and Mother's Day, in, in one particular sense, reminds me of something that I really appreciate about Christmas time. At uh, Christmas time, in spite of the best efforts of a whole movement to eliminate basically Christianity and our Christian heritage from our country, still you can go inside the store, you can hear on the radio or on television words like, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Or, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. So they've not been completely successful in eliminating Christ from Christmas. And during Christmas time, um, people are confronted with the reality of the incarnation of Jesus Christ in spite of themselves. And in a similar way, I find myself appreciating Mother's Day and Father's Day more and more. With all of the confusion, foolishness, and insanity surrounding sex and gender in our culture, I think it's so cool that on Mother's Day, there's no debate that mom is a woman. And today, on Father's Day, there's no debate that dad is a man. I think that's cool. Today, we get a 24-hour break from our culture's gender madness. It's Father's Day. Hallelujah. But that's not the focus of our Bible study this morning. We're not going to talk about fatherhood in uh, general, but we're going to focus on one specific aspect of, of being a father, one specific aspect of the responsibility uh, of fathers, and that's the responsibility to be an example to his children. So for that, we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy 4.12, like I mentioned, and uh, we're going to read that here in a couple of seconds, but just a um, a qualification or a disclaimer. I know this passage is not directed specifically at fathers. It's actually directed at Timothy as a leader in the church, as a church leader. But um, as we have pointed out before, the, um, the moral qualifications, the spiritual qualifications that Paul gives to Timothy for church leadership in 1 Timothy are not any different than uh, what is required for, for all Christians and especially all men to follow. It's just that church leaders are supposed to be exemplary. Church leaders are supposed to um, be an example. And that's actually made pretty explicit in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, where one of the qualifications for an, an elder or pastor is, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? There's a connection between leadership in the home and leadership in the church. And so this charge to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12 certainly applies to church leadership but it also applies to household leadership as well, and I think you'll, you'll agree. So uh, let's read starting in verse 11, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 11. Command and teach these things. What things? Well, everything Paul's been writing up to this point in his letter to Timothy. Then he says, let no one despise you for your youth. So Timothy was a relatively young man, 
probably uh, best guess mid 30s, maybe 30 to 35. Let no one despise you for your youth. But then Paul does not say, go in and run roughshod over people, force them, insist that they respect you in spite of your youth. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, but set the believers an example. So here's how he was to, to win their respect. Not by force, not by coercion, not by playing the authority card, but by setting an example. In what ways? In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. So these specific ways in which Timothy and all church leaders are to set an example are the same ways that fathers are to set an example as well in their homes. After all, our homes are little churches. And besides that, there's just common sense. John Maxwell, the famous uh, author and speaker, he's a pastor as well, and he does a lot of um, writing and teaching on leadership, and he said, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. And then Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, the English preacher from the um, 1800s, uh, when he commented on, on Proverbs 22.6, he quoted from Proverbs 22.6, and it's familiar to you, train up a child in the way he should go. And then Spurgeon adds this, but be sure you go that way yourself. So it's, it's obvious when it comes to leadership that really the number one thing as far as leadership goes is to be an example. So we are going to take Paul's words from 1 Timothy 4.12 and apply them to um, fathers. And so from man to man, dad to dad, this morning I'm saying, and the content of our Bible this, uh, study this morning is going to be saying, Dad, be an example to your children. So the first thing that Paul says to Timothy in terms of how he should be an example to the believers is in speech. Do you see that in verse 12? But set the believers an example in speech. And that might be surprising I'm not sure what you may have expected. But according to Paul, the, the first way that a Christian leader should set an example is in terms of, of speech. And in terms of church leadership, that does make sense because one of the main things that a church leader does, especially a pastor, is teach the word of God, proclaim the word of God. And so if we're going to be proclaiming God's word, then we have to be careful with our words in general. We have to be careful with our mouths. But it turns out that's a general principle for all Christians. Jesus is the one who said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Jesus says that your, your mouth is like this dipstick that goes down into your heart and reveals what's actually in your heart. And so if there's, if there's filth and harshness and lies and such things that come out of your mouth, according to Jesus, it comes out of your mouth because that's what's in your heart. And conversely, if kindness and mercy and truth and godliness comes out of your mouth it's because that's what's that's what's in your heart out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so this is a very important subject what we say what we speak what we do with our mouths as christians so permit me we're not going to drag this out but permit me a few minutes for this mini quick bible study on our speech and for these first two points, look with me in Ephesians. It's the same author, 
the Apostle Paul. And by the way, uh, Timothy ends up being the, um, the main leader in the church in Ephesus. But in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, listen to what Paul says. Remember, this is now uh, explicitly to all believers, not just church leaders. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So the first thing I would say in terms of this quick Bible study on our speech is tell the truth. Don't lie with your tongue. Of course, the Bible says a lot more than that uh, in terms of lying, but We'll restrict ourselves to this passage for now. But then also in Ephesians chapter 4, we hear the Apostle Paul teaching on how we should avoid corrupt language. Notice Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Corrupt or corrupting means rotten, poor quality unfit for use, worthless. And in other places, Paul is more specific about foul language. So in Ephesians 5 and verse 4, for example, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And again, you go back to the me metaphor that Jesus gave us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The reason why it's unfitting, it's out of place for Christians to be engaged in filthy language, foolish talk, crude joking, is because as Christians, we have new hearts and that kind of thing is part of our past, not part of our new identity in Christ, our new godly nature. And then in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8, the same apostle wrote, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. So Christians need to avoid obscenities, uh, corrupt speech, filthy speak, uh, speech, crude jokes. And then we should say things that build up by contrast. Say things that build up. So back to Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, for edifying. And he goes on, as fits the occasion that may give grace to those who hear. Too often, sinful people, fallen people like us, use our words as weapons. We use our words, sadly, to punish, to tear down, to get even. And Paul says that's completely unfitting. Rather than tearing down, we should use our words to, to build up. Rather than condemn, we should use our words to give grace. And that takes intention. That takes thought. We, we have to think through what we're going to say. And even when we're going to say it, he does say, as fits the occasion. Sometimes the occasion says, just don't say anything. It's not edifying. It's not gracious. It's not going to help. Just hold your peace. But when the occasion is right, we should say things not just to get our point across, not just to prove that we're right, but we should try to build up and impart grace. It's revolutionary. It's revolutionary. Christianity changes everything. Even this, this little, what James says, this little unruly member, right? No man can tame the tongue. I think about the movie um, I Can Only Imagine. Did you guys see that movie? 
It's the, the backstory of the song by Mercy Me, I Can Only Imagine. Uh, really, it's the, it's the life story of Bart Millard, the leader of Mercy Me. And I, I've seen the movie twice and I cried both times. It's a real tearjerker. I think it's really, really well done. Uh, Dennis Quaid does a fabulous job of playing Bart's dad in the movie. And to make a long story short, uh, when Bart Millard was being raised at home, his dad was very abusive. He was an alcoholic, uh, violent, and he used his mouth violently against his son. He would put him down constantly. You're never going to amount to anything, and blah, blah, blah. It was just uh, terrible. And then eventually God saves Bart's uh, father shortly before his death from cancer. I don't want to give, I don't want to spoil the story anymore for you, but that's what this made me think of. And so when it comes to fathers with our children, we should avoid calling our children names, for example or insulting them, or tearing them down, or discouraging them unnecessarily. But with our children, we dads need to build them up and impart grace to those who hear. Who hear. There are definitely times to correct, but we need to be careful to not tear them down as we correct. And then avoid harsh words. Avoid harsh words. Proverbs 15.1 A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And then finally, avoid gossip. Avoid gossip. Proverbs 17.9 Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Whoever covers an offense there means um, covers it as opposed to disclosing it. So as dads, really as parents, but today's Father's Day, dads, we need to be careful about gossiping in front of our kids because in their hearts, we will separate close friends. We will end up putting a bad impression in our kids' hearts about the person that we're gossiping about. And there's other things that the Bible says about speech. Enough for now. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, the word of God says to us to be an example in speech. Secondly, be an example in conduct. Be an example in conduct. Our, our conduct is our manner of life, our walk. It's how we live day in and day out. At the gas station, in the grocery line, at the soccer game, washing the car, wh wherever. 24-7, 365 days a year, our conduct our manner of life. And this, uh, you might think, should go without saying, but um, this has a lot to do with my own personal testimony. Um, lots of folks don't make the connection between faith in Christ and how you live. And I've, I've shared with you all a number of times, that was, that was me. I did not get that. I was not an atheist. I, I, I would have not been a Luciferian. Uh, I would have considered myself a believer in God and a believer in Jesus. Don't ask me to explain the gospel. Don't ask me to explain what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And don't ask me why I think it's okay for me to be talking the way that I did. And by the way, the, the speech thing, uh, before I was saved, frankly, I had a filthy mouth. And it's not that I never, ever, ever slip, but my mouth ain't the same today that it was before I was converted. And honestly, that was one way that I saw something happened. Because all of a sudden, I stopped cursing and I stopped telling my filthy jokes and all of that. In any event, um, I, I did not make that connection between faith 
and life. I didn't think there was a connection. I thought I was going to heaven because I believed in Jesus, but it sure didn't affect my life. And you know what I found out since I got saved from that? A lot of people think that. A lot of people don't realize, well, if you're a Christian, that actually affects your manner of life. It affects how you live. We've already seen it affects your tongue, your speech. Well, it affects all of your life. Paul in Ephesians 4.1, just one example, said, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We have been called to Christ and we have been called to a walk, a, a walk with Jesus, a walk that glorifies Jesus, a walk in which we follow Jesus because the Jesus who saves the, the Jesus of John 3.16 is both Savior and Lord. God has made him Savior and Lord. And if you believe in Jesus, if you receive Jesus, you receive him as Savior and Lord. And if he's your Lord, he's your master, you must follow him. You must keep his commandments. That's why he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Um, I do want to show you a few passages in Titus. I, I think this is interesting. Titus chapter 2. Let's look there. Titus is right after uh, 1 and 2 Timothy. It's part of the pastoral epistles, these letters from Paul to um, pastors, to church leaders. 1 Timothy, then Titus. Notice what Paul wrote to Titus in chapter 2 and verse 7. Titus 2 and verse 7. Here Paul uh, instructs Titus, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech, etc. We've seen that before, haven't we? 1 Timothy 4.12, be an example to the believers in speech. Here he says, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. So think about that. What does good works have to do with being a Christian leader? What does it have to do with being a Christian at all? Because after all, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not a result of your works, lest anyone should boast. Ah, but you forget the rest of the passage in Ephesians 2.10 where Paul says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So a summary of Ephesians 2.8-10, through 10, we are not saved by good works, that would be impossible, but verse 10, we are saved for good works. We're his workmanship. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so works and a profession of faith in Jesus go hand in hand. When you say you have been saved by Jesus, you're saying Jesus has saved me from my sin. He has saved me from my past manner of life, which was sinful, which was opposed to the things of God, which was all about myself and this world and the things in the world. And he has set me on a new course by his powerful, omnipotent grace that we sung about earlier. That's why Christian leaders are to be a model of good works. And then notice down in verse 14, 
Titus 2 and verse 14. In, in verse 13, here's Jesus who is our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And yes, Jesus Christ is our great God. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from all lawlessness. Now, once again, lots of folks assume that means, oh, Jesus gave himself for me so I can be forgiven. It's true, it's part of it, but it's not the whole story. Jesus redeems us from all lawlessness. Notice this, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is why Jesus gave himself. The purpose of Jesus' death in our behalf is so that, we would, so that he would purify for himself a people who are zealous for good works. It's part of our profession of faith. It's part of being a Christian. And then, notice verse, oh, actually verse 8, sorry. Oh, I think I covered it all. Ephesians 2, 7, 14, 3, 8, and 14. So, good works go hand in hand with a profession of faith in Christ. It's what James says in James chapter 2. Um, James says, you show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. The faith that saves is a living faith that produces the fruit of good works. And that's why Christian leaders, including Christian dads, are to be an example in conduct. So dads, dads, you're living out your Christianity, you're living out your faith before an audience. Certainly, before the audience of God, God is watching, and it's, it's our golden life to be pleasing to God as his children. But there's another audience who's watching, and that's the audience of your children. And we are called to be an example to our kids in conduct. Moving on to number three here. Paul says, 1 Timothy 4.12, that we should be an example in love. Set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love. Be an example. Jesus said that the two great commandments are, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, you shall love your neighbor as your self. And then John ends up saying that the, the, the greatest commandment, the new commandment, which isn't new objectively, but it's new in terms of its importance, its priority, its, its power. A new commandment is love, that we should love one another. We should love all of our fellow human beings. That's the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan. But we should love in a peculiar way, that's what the Bible says, the household of faith, other believers, other children of God. We should love Christ's people. In fact, John uses love for Christ's people as a test to see if you're actually saved. 1 John 3 verses 14 and 16 and, and others there in 1 John. He says, by this you know that you've been brought from death to life because you love the brethren. And why is loving the brethren so important? Because we love Jesus. If you're a Christian, you love Jesus. This is how Peter put it. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And that's not a scientific thing, but it's, it's real, it's spiritual. We, we, 
We've never seen Jesus. We've heard about him from his word, but it even goes beyond the mere written word. We know and love the person, Jesus Christ. We've embraced him personally by faith. He indwells us now by faith. He's in us and we are in him and we love him. And that's a good thing to test ourselves with once in a while because it's easy to get caught up with the do's and the don'ts, the the routines, the rituals of the Christian life, the, the duties. But at base... Being a Christian means you love Jesus. You love him. Do you love Jesus? Dads, do you love Jesus? And can your kids tell that you love Jesus? And in terms of being an example in love, show your children that you love Jesus their mother. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Um, It was the abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher who who said, and by the way, I've heard this quote from a number of other sources, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Dads, be an example to your kids in love. Number four, be an example in faith. Be an example in faith. Um, Look with me, please, into Hebrews. So first and second Timothy, Titus, Hebrews. Philemon, sorry, then Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. So when Paul tells Timothy, when the Bible tells us dads, to be an example in faith, Hebrews chapter 11 is a good place to look. What in the world does that mean? I'm going to let you read Hebrews chapter 11 on your own, but I want to point out three verses that are key here. What is faith? Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith defines our hope. Remember, our faith is in Christ. Our faith is in the gospel. Our faith is in the kingdom. And so we need to model for our kids that our hope is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's all about his kingdom. And like we've seen from Peter, it's a savior whom we've not seen, yet we love him. And then notice verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Um, That is worth a sermon by itself, but let me just say this. Um, Faith and science do not contradict each other. Faith and scientists often do. Because scientists confuse their own faith with science. They're not the same thing. But the reason why faith and science don't contradict itself is because of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. Because when you ask an atheist, an atheist wants everything to be proved empirically, but that itself is an article of faith that everything must be proved empirically. Could you prove to me empirically that everything has to be proved empirically? And of course, they they can't. 
And eventually what happens is it's exposed or revealed that they've got this worldview, they've got a set of assumptions that they've made that include scientific laws and the laws of logic and reason. And they just assume that those things are true and valid, but they can't account for them. They can't say where they come from, why they exist, why they work. They just are. Well, if Hebrews 11 and verse 3 tells us why they exist and where they come from. They came from God, and more specifically, the Word of God, the Logos, the logic, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So we don't believe in the Big Bang, per se, but we do believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and before there was a material existence, there was the immaterial, eternal God, who then brought into existence all that is visible. And then he continues to uphold them. And that's why we can observe scientific laws in creation. And that's why logic exists and it works. It's not just because, it's because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Anyway, my point here is that I believe we as dads need to be an example to our kids of this kind of faith. And then in verse 6, notice this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We need to be examples to our kids of the kind of faith that seeks God, that believes the word of God. Be an example in faith. Then, fifthly, be an example in purity. Set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Purity starts from the heart. Christianity is a religion about purity, for sure, but it's an inside-out viewpoint rather than an outside-in. And that's why Jesus said in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so it's important that we as dads show our children that we're serious about cultivating a pure heart. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And that's the secret of cultivating a pure heart, being careful about what you allow in. Purity in the New Testament often refers specifically to sexual purity. We have to mention that. Dads, show your kids that you take the admonition of Jesus seriously. Remember Sermon on the Mount once again? Jesus says, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that if you uh, look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Heart adultery. And a little bit of uh, background, confession, Uh, It turns out when I was a kid growing up, and I'm not going to give you any specific information, I don't want to bag on anyone else, but I do have very vivid memories. When I was growing up, on both sides, my next door neighbors on both sides had homes filled with pornography. And I remember the one neighbor, um, (laughs) his dad had, they had a camper in the front, and his dad had these hefty bags hefty bag after hefty bag filled with with Playboy magazines. And my friend and I, we helped ourselves. 
It, it, I, it was a mess. I know I have been saved by grace. But what a terrible example for those particular dads. In fact, as far as I know, they subscribed to Playboy and their wives knew it. But what a mess. What confusion. What a terrible example for sons, uh, for dads to be involved with filth like that. <clears throat> and then before we leave this point here of being an example in purity, show your kids what to do when you blow it. Look with me in 1 John. And I know we're about out of time here. 1 John. Chapter 1, verse 8. John says to Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even as Christians, we can still say with Paul, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Don't say you have no more sin. But then John goes on, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he repeats what he said in verse 8, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And then notice this, chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. We're not supposed to sin. We don't have a license to sin. Let us not think. Let us sin that grace may abound. I write these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And really, one of the most powerful examples uh, you can provide for your kids is to own your sins, confess your sins, right to your kids. You, you blow it with them in terms of disciplining them or whatever, raising your voice, losing it, confess it. Show your kids what it looks like to repent. Show your kids what it looks like to throw yourself at the mercy of the God of heaven, the merciful one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Show your kids what to do with your sin. And in all these ways and more, be an example in purity. You can sum up all of this with the words of uh, evangelist and evangelical leader Deal Moody, who said, a man ought to live so that everybody knows he's a Christian. And most of all, his family ought to know. Before we pray, just real, real quickly, look to Christ, brothers. Look to Christ. A message like this, because we've been focused on duty, uh, it can be convicting. It's been convicting to me preparing it. But you know, it's possible. It's possible that somebody could be exposed in terms of them realizing, you know what? I'm not a Christian. I don't love Jesus. These things aren't true about me. I don't care about how I live. I don't care about my conduct. I don't have genuine biblical saving faith. And, and if that's you, you can't go back and undo anything. That's not the message of Christianity. The message of the Christianity is look to Christ. Come to Christ as you are. Repenting from your sins. Putting your trust in Jesus. And for you brothers in the Lord, a message like this from God's word exposes our sins and our shortcomings, but we know we're believers We're not the men we should be, but we're also not the wretches we would be if Christ had not saved us. And we need to look to Christ too. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And then grow in godliness. Remember that Christian, the Christian faith is a life of growth. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in the context in which we've been studying here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 15, 
Paul said to Timothy, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Dads, if you've been blowing it and today you're repenting, today you're resolving to be more faithful in your following of Jesus as a dad, confess your sin to your family, but then be an example to your family of making progress. Let them see your progress as a future, uh, as a Christian dad. And then finally, mothers and children, encourage your husband or your father, as the case may be. This is not the time for condemnation. This is not the time to say, I told you so. This is not the time to say, you're a lousy dad or, or whatever. In the book that the guys just stopped studying through, uh, we finished, I should say, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hand by Paul David Tripp. He wrote, People need encouragement as they pursue the hard work of change. They need truths that will motivate and strengthen them. And that's true of dads. We need encouragement from our wives, from our kids, from our brethren. We don't need condemnation. The devil is very good at that. All of us, in whatever area of the Christian life we're talking about, it's, it's so much more inviting and so much easier to change with encouragement. And God is our greatest encouragers. Brothers, our families are worth it. Our Savior is worth it. Our Savior, who's described by Paul in this passage, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the instruction of your word. We know, Lord, that all scripture is God-breathed, and it is profitable, it is useful for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We pray, Lord, that you would equip us. We pray that you would minister grace where sin has been exposed, that you would bring salvation where perhaps somebody is realizing they're not saved. And that, Lord, you would bring grace to grow and abound and to press on and to be more faithful in the future where that need has been exposed. But, Lord, help us to be men of your word, men of your grace, men of our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.